So one of my goals in my comparative study is not simply to say certain things that are Hindu look like certain things that are Christian. That's very easy. But rather to break the way I'm thinking and to begin to think differently. Sometimes we don't, in the West, go deep enough into the Indian tradition to really think in terms of the categories and the language of thought of Hinduism. And part of the problem is that the Western mind, as I have here, can be tempted to simply take certain thoughts from Hindu texts and put them into Christian Western categories. The category of Orientalism, where the colonial rulers explaining the countries they visited in terms that gave them justification politically to conquer the countries. If you read a text like the Jaimini and the Ayamala, it gives you a great insight into Purva Mimamsa and the world around it. The study of Mimamsa, study of Vedanta, study of Latin, study of Greek is a slow, sure process of taking tradition and bringing it into the 21st century. And that I think is something we can do. If we study beyond our own tradition, this can enhance and deepen even the most familiar Shastras are understood. So we learn Shastra according to Shastra, but we learn it in a 21st century way that I think might even surprise the great scholars of our traditions because we do something different because we are different people. I am grateful to Professor Gowri and Professor Nagaraj for the invitation to come and speak with you. This is my first visit to the university and hopefully not my last visit, so I am grateful for this opportunity to speak to you today. So what I would like to do, uh, because when we were emailing Professor Gowri and I about this opportunity, there were really two things we were talking about. One was to talk about my own Indological Sanskrit research in Purva Mimamsa. But the other was about the university context in the United States, the way we do research, and the problems that come up. So I thought I would try to combine both and talk to you about them together. And my hope is to go only about 30, 35 minutes. So I put up simply as a starting point here, this is a picture of Harvard Divinity School. A uh, beautiful campus, 200 years old, not very old by Indian standards, but American standards, it's an old university. And I've been teaching there, as was said, for about 14, 15 years and previously at the Catholic University. So I'll try to make this work so that we can um, see, you can follow along. Part of my work is simply comparative work. And I think, um, I just point this out, even though I'll turn quickly to Mimamsa, taking up themes in my work, talking about some theme in Christian theology and then in some Brahminical Hindu theology. So in this book, Hindu God, Christian God, talking about the existence of God, the name of God, God in the world, and God and revelation, mainly with major Christian thinkers and then how it works out mainly in Vaishnavism, Shaivism, and Vedanta. Back and forth, trying to tell Christian theologians that if they are interested in talking about God, the nature of God, the name of God, they should learn from Indian thought as well, not simply only Christian sources. As a follow-up book, I did this book, Divine Mother, Blessed Mother, Hindu Goddesses and the Virgin Mary, as you know, the goddesses are so important in Hindu tradition, and I felt I wanted to call this to the attention of readers in the West. And because I am a comparativist, I wanted to make some connection back to Christian tradition. And so the Virgin Mary, Mother Mary and Catholic tradition here in Kerala is so important, not to make the point that Mary and the goddesses are the same, because they're not the same, but rather to say when we appreciate the goddesses, the devis, the amans of Hindu tradition. That gives a Christian 
a different way of looking at the Virgin Mary in Christian tradition. So it's like looking into a mirror. You look into the other and you see yourself differently. However, today I would like to go further and talk about the problem of needing to go deeper. Because I think one of the problems we have in study with the West and India is that sometimes we don't, in the West, go deep enough into the Indian tradition to really think in terms of the categories and the language of thought of Hinduism. So as you, as you probably know, I cannot speak Sanskrit, I cannot teach in Sanskrit. I don't get the training, the Shastraic training that some of you already have. So we study in our own way and we can read the text and so on, but we don't think in the categories of Sanskrit or Tamil or Hindi or Bengali. And part of the problem is that the Western mind, as I have here, can be tempted to simply take certain thoughts from Hindu texts and put them into Christian Western categories. So not really changing the way we think, but simply putting the Hindu into the Christian categories. This happened often in missionary scholarship. Uh, many Catholic missionaries, Protestant missionaries came to India, as you know. Sometimes good, sometimes not good. But often it was simply an effort to talk about Hindu ideas, positive or negative, in Christian categories, according to the Bible. And I think many of the missionaries did not really succeed in understanding the Hindu text on their own. They were looking at it only from the outside. And as people have pointed out in the past 50 years, the category of Orientalism. I'm sure Orientalism is well known to you, where the colonial rulers uh, in the Middle East, Edward Said wrote his book about the British and the French, but also the Spanish and the Portuguese, the, the colonists who came to India, to China, Japan, explaining the countries they visited in terms that gave them justification politically to conquer the countries. And so instead of disinterested objective knowledge, often the Orientalists were deliberately explaining India in a certain way to justify Portuguese rule, or French rule, or Dutch rule, or English, British rule. And these categories are very hard to break. I'm sure you could say the same about thinking in French or thinking in Greek or Latin, to think outside the categories of your own culture can be very difficult. So one of my goals in my comparative study is not simply to say certain things that are Hindu look like certain things that are Christian. That's very easy. But rather to break the way I'm thinking and to begin to think differently. So sometimes the Western philosophical grip, like a clasp on the study of India, is too abstracted from context just picking up the text and looking at the text separately from the context, the living context, the philosophical context even. Uh, too much focus on issues of epistemology, knowledge, and metaphysical issues, such as in Mimamsa we find in the Tarkapada. And I'll come back to this in a moment, that many Western scholars who study Purva Mimamsa only get through the first sutras. They're interested in the theory of knowledge, the metaphysics, aparusheyatwa, and so on, and leave it at that. Because I think the, con the problem of the Western philosophical mind is we want things that we can already talk about and think about easily. So we need to look beyond the philosophical issues and beyond sections of the sutras, such as the Tarkapada. One of the reasons that I came, and I'll tell you more in a moment, about studying Purva Mimamsa, which has hardly been studied too much in the West. As you know, there is much more interest in Vedanta. In some parts of the Western scholarly world, Nyaya is somewhat important. Obviously, yoga is very important, both the practice, but also books about Patanjali yoga and so on. But I found that the Mimamsa is often left on the side often with a pejorative or negative viewpoint, it's just about ritual. It's only ritual thinking. It's not that important. And my interest was, if Mimamsa is so uniquely Indian, and a way of legal reasoning in the Indian context, 
can I begin to understand the Mimamsa way of thinking? And so that was a challenge before me. So when I went to graduate school, my PhD at the University of Chicago, back in 1979, I actually wanted first to study Shankara Vedanta. That was my original starting point. But reading Shankara Vedanta, first in English and then parts of the, the Bhashya in Sanskrit and so on, I found and was curious that there were all these references to ritual context, these niyayas. And I asked my professor, where are these niyayas, these rules about this in the ritual, like the Agni Hotra, or the priest clinging to the cloak of the one in front of them, or the yupa about the post and so on. These are not in the Upanishads. Where are they coming from? And I learned fairly quickly, these came from the school I knew nothing about, Purva Mimamsa. So although I started with the intention to write a thesis on Shankara Vedanta, maybe also Ramanuja Vedanta, I found that I needed to back up and study Mimamsa. So instead of Uttara Mimamsa, go back instead of study the Purva Mimamsa. And this for me was very good because Vedanta has often fallen into the categories of Western philosophy. Is it monism or not? What is non-dualism? Is Brahman like Hegel's idealism or whatever? But nobody was doing that with the Purva Mimamsa. So learning about it by reading Shankara Bhashya, I started to read Jaimini and Shabra and go back to reading them, which then became my thesis project. And I learned in, in studying the Mimamsa, particularly if you don't start with the Tarkapada, but if you go into the rest of the text, there are so many ritual references, uh, problems from the Shrauta texts, from the Veda, the mantras, and so on, that it becomes this great challenge to begin to learn about the ritual, the Vedic context, in order to understand how they're thinking. And this for me was very exciting. So I found that Mimamsa was a great challenge to the Western mind, that the cases, the Adhikaranas in the Mimamsa Sutras, of which there are at least 900 Adhikaranas, were really like case problems, case studies, to sit down and think about them and try to understand not only what the answer is, but what the question is first, and to begin to think in that way. And of course, because it has to do with ritual, there's a sense that it's not just theory, but it's related to practice and to a way of life. And so this for me was exciting. So my challenge number nine was the question of the great bulk of the sutras, the at least 2,500 sutras of Jaimini after the first Adhyaya. And it's a very large text, as you know, it's, it's a massive text, 200, 2,700 sutras. And I found most scholars in the West were just looking at the first part and then stopping. And so I began to read the entire sutras. I actually typed out for myself once on a typewriter all the sutras just by themselves. So Shabara Bhashya is important, but I wanted to read the sutras alone. So I typed up all 2,700 sutras, and this was before laptops. So I had to go through and put in the, the long mark, the short mark, and so on by hand with my pencil. So it took a long time, but I learned a lot. And obviously it needed to be done patiently, because if one is debating epistemological issues of knowledge or metaphysical issues, you can immediately begin to talk on a large level. But I found that the Mimamsa cases, the Adhikaranas, slowed you down. And for me as a Western scholar, it was good that it slowed me down, because it made me think differently. So this was my first book, Thinking Ritually, Rediscovering the Purva Mimamsa of Jaimini. And my argument uh, in part in the book was to read the whole of the sutras. Uh, don't just read the first part. But also I found the very interesting experience that reading the sutras was not the same as reading Shabra Bhashya. So Shabra is the absolutely necessary commentator. The sutras are very difficult. Without Shabra, we cannot learn what the Mimamsa cases are. But that doesn't mean that Shabra, writing some centuries after Jaimini, is saying exactly the same thing. And so I began to see some small differences in style, 
in vocabulary, in some of the questions raised by Jaimini, and the explanations given by Shabara. And all the more so than Kumara Labhata, Prabhakara Mishra, and so on later on, there was a difference between the sutras and what followed. And so much of this book, which I have no time to talk about now, was really trying to explain how we can begin to read the entirety of Jaimini's sutras as a starting point for thinking again in a new way about Purvami Mamsa. And I think that was what I tried to do, and I think it came out fairly well. I was in Vienna recently, where the book was published in 1990. It's part of a series called the Dinobili series. And they, I was happy when they told me my book was the best-selling book in the series. It's still in print um, and still sells copy. And as you know, and this, I'll, I'll do this very quickly, the themes of the Adyayas of Jaimini, and some of you I'm sure know this very well, had to do with certain kinds of approaches to the ritual texts, certain kind of themes that come up in each of the Adyayas of Jaimini Sutras. And I found that the point was, as they say, legal reasoning, case reasoning, as some of you I think have legal background, you've gone to law school, that just with you, when you take up a case in the high court or something, you're always looking around it at the rules, how to interpret the rules, how the rules fit, which rule is more important than another rule, when the rule does not apply, when you have an exception, and so on. I found that's exactly what Jaimini is doing in his own way, in case after case after case. And I simply, I won't go through this because we don't have time, but for the, the 12 Adyayas, the basic themes, the Pramana, Karma Beda, Sheshatwa, Purusharta, Kratvarta, and so on, that each Adyaya has a certain approach. So issues of difference or dividing rituals, uh, Sheshi, Shesha Baba. Um, Krama, Adhikara, and so on, and that these are quite interesting because these are not philosophical categories. We're not talking about Brahman, or Dharma, or Moksha, or Ishwara, or Bhakti, Prapatti, whatever. These are categories that many scholars who study Hinduism or thought in India would have very little to say about because these are legal categories of hermeneutics and analysis, and they don't really make any sense unless you go and read and see what they're actually about. So much of my work has been fascinating about trying to think in terms of these categories and how they work, and then later, of course, how they might apply in the Vedanta as well. I, gave, I sent out, I think Gauri sent out the, um, the handout that I have, and we won't go through this, but I took some cases from the third Ajaya, the fourth Pada, these cases about small ritual details and rules, like whether, what happens if you yawn during a ritual, uh, are you, what happens, are you able to say something negative about the Brahman, should you talk to the woman, your, your wife, during the ritual practice, yes, no, yes, no, no, yes, yes, no, those cases. In the sixth Ajaya, the first Pada, about Adhikara, sacrifices for those who want swarga, swarga kamo yajeta, those who want to be happy. Does that mean everybody can perform all sacrifices? Yes, but then no. So if you're blind and cannot see, if you cannot speak, if you cannot walk, you become disqualified. Uh, women also want to be happy, obviously. And is that okay then? Well, yes, but no, no, yes, no, and so on. And shudras. And so these are categories about eligibility, adhikara, in the sixth ajaya. And the, the issue of smriti, both the text and the practices in the third pada of the first ajaya, about, like I remember one is when the yupa is wrapped in a cloth, and it says to touch, touch the yupa, the, the sacrificial post at this point. Is it okay to have it wrapped in the cloth? Well, no, because you can't touch it if it's wrapped in the cloth. And the suspicion arises that this is due to the self-interest of the person who wrote the rule, I would like a silk cloth. So give me a silk cloth. And so it's ruled out that even though some people do this, this custom from Smriti is not allowed. So each case has a certain kind of social, political context, an issue about the nature of society, and I found them fascinating. 
And yet those three that I give there, three, four, six, one, one, three, most scholars who think about the philosophy of sacrifice, the philosophy of the Veda in the West, would not be interested in these cases. But I found them fascinating because they helped me to begin thinking according to the categories of Mimamsa instead of simply imposing my categories onto Mimamsa. So I think you see the point. And then finally, not first, and this sounds very strange to not read the first part of the sutras first, but to come back and say one one, the Tarkapada, the issue of Dharma, knowledge of Dharma, Pratyaksha, uh, Shabya Nityatva, Aparusheya, and so on that these questions can be taken in terms of arguments with the Nyayakas, arguments with the Buddhas, Buddhists, and so on. But in some sense, these are presuppositions and justifications for the previous cases. So the point of the Tarkapada is not simply Mimamsa philosophy, or Mimamsa explaining the nature of epistemology or metaphysics, but it's like a, a protective wall around the thinking of the rest of the 2700 sutras. So if you see my point, I don't mean to ignore the Tarkapada, but rather saying that scholars who only read the Tarkapada are missing most of what Mimams is about. And therefore to go back, and I gave the examples on the handout I sent of these other cases, are training the mind to think differently about these matters. In doing this, and in the handout that I sent out that many of you received, I used this later text, the Jaimaniya Nyayamala of Madhavacharya, which is a beautiful text that I, I had a copy of for many decades in three volumes from the 19th century, and was fascinated that this was a summation of the entirety of Jaimini Sutras, the 900 Adhikaranas, in about 1400 shlokas. And I have no good memory, I can't memorize them. But nonetheless, I think somebody who has skill in memorizing and is good at speaking Sanskrit and so on, you get the entirety of Jaimini's system in a very succinct form. Now Madhava is paying attention to Parthasarati Mishra, he's paying attention to Kumara Labhata, to Prabhakara Mishra, he's not ignoring them. But he's saying you can take every case and reduce it to two lines or sometimes four lines in shloka form. And I found it to be a brilliant, kind of succinct summation of Mimamsa that in studying it, I found it fascinating and clarifying. So at one point I was trying to translate the Jaimini and the Ayamala, and I have a rough translation of maybe 80-85% of the text. But then I ran into the question that I have here, number C, so studying Madhava is very wonderful, it's very exciting, but why? So what? And this is really the last part of what I want to say, is that this deep learning, learning the Shastra, learning the Darshana, becomes very specialized for a few people. And then instead of saying, just as we might all you know, study uh, one of the great teachers of modern times, like Swami Vivekananda or someone, or you might go back and read Ramanuja or Shankara, or read Bhagavad Gita or Upanishads. Who in the world wants to read Jaimini and Nyayamala? Probably only the people in this room and a few others. So very specialized knowledge, very particular knowledge. And it raised for me the question that if you read a text like the Jaimini and Nyayamala, it gives you a great insight into Purva Mimamsa and the world around it. But who has the time, who has the patience to do that study? And I think well, I was talking to a number of you about your wonderful system of slow learning, a course of study that goes maybe for two years on a certain theme or topic, which is wonderful. But in the US, we often have 13 weeks to do a course, 13 two-hour classes. And then the next semester, the students do something entirely different. So how can you possibly learn anything in depth if you're doing it so quickly? So it became for me an issue of interreligious learning. Here I am from the West, studying Mimamsa, not just the Tarkapada, but all these cases and so on. 
again, for whom? What is the value of this learning? And the crisis I tried to take up in, the, in my most recent book, which I'll tell you briefly about and then I'll be finished, was really to answer these questions, why do we study? Why study Mimamsa? How do we study? What is our method of study? Our time of study? How long do we study? Can you study the book by yourself? Do you need a teacher to study? And so on, those very basic questions. And in this context, is there any value in studying two traditions together? As I said at the beginning, I'm a comparativist. And the idea of studying the other tradition, coming back to my own tradition, back and forth, is agreeable to some people, but not to everybody. They say, I don't get the point of studying another tradition. Why bother? And I think that's a real question as well. So I wrote this book, which is not a best, it is not a best-selling book because it has not come out yet. Uh, it's coming out, I think, next month, in the month of September but reading the Hindu and Christian classics. Why and how deep learning still matters. And I think it's really, in some ways, a tribute to the kind of learning that you're doing here, deep learning. And again, it, it was originally going to be a book about Madhava's text, Jaimini and Nyayamala, but eventually it became a larger project because I felt I would write this book and there would be only a few people in the world who would ever read the book. And so the question was, how do we study and why do we learn? And in the book, going to being a comparativist, I made the first text, the Jaimini and Nyayamala, but then I needed to expand my horizon by connecting it with other texts. So I, I find the, the, the garland, as I translate it, garland of Jaimini's reasons, very instructive. It fills out for me in a kind of catechetical way a way of thinking from classical India, I read it with the greater catechism of Peter Canisius, a, uh, a, a scholar of the 16th century in the West writing in Latin, who summarizes the entire Christian faith in about a hundred pages. And reading and being instructed in Purva Mimamsa with Madhava and Christian doctrine, Christian basics with Peter Canisius, was instructing my mind twice over. Then doctrine, the truth of doctrine, how do we learn the truth in our tradition? And I'm sure many of you are more expert on this text than I am, but the Siddhanta Lesha Sangraha of Apaya Dikshita, a text that I found wonderful because it is within the Advaita school. It's, it's not about the Buddhists, it's not about Vishishtadvaita, not about the Nyayakas but all the different opinions on topics like Brahman, Ishwara, the nature of the world, and so on, different Advaita views. And I think if you study the uh, Sangraha from beginning to end, there is a whole course of learning the truth of Advaita Vedanta, page by page, case by case, that clarifies the truth of the system in a certain way. I'm sure others of you may recommend other texts, but this I found useful with a famous book from the Catholic tradition, The Sentences in Four Books, The Sentences of Peter Lombard, which was the most popular theological text in the Christian Middle Ages. Everybody wrote commentaries on The Sentences of Peter Lombard. So reading parts of Lombard and parts of Dikshita together was teaching the truth of two traditions together. But it required, again, the point, slow reading, careful reading, great patience, because you can't go fast. And I had to finish my book, but I tried to go as slow, as slow as possible. And then participation in the worship of another tradition, finding texts that would invite the reader to come in. Don't just look from outside, but come on in. Become part of our tradition. And so here I have a text from the Tamil tradition, the Tiruvaimori Nutrandadi by Manavala Mamunigal, one of the great Tengalai scholars of Tamil Vaishnavism, a beautiful summary in verses of Namalvar's Tiruvai Mori, the great text of Tamil devotion. Reading it, and Manavala Mamuni saying, this is so beautiful. If you learn this, if you repeat it, if you sing it, you will find yourself becoming part of our tradition. 
Similarly, on the other side, a book from the 18th century, Louis Grignon de Montfort, The Admirable Secret of Most Holy Rosary, the rosary beads that Catholics say, claiming that if you say the rosary, you say everything true about the Catholic faith. And he's saying, don't just think about this, do it. Pick up your rosary beads and join in. So what I tried to do is beginning with Mimamsa, Madhava, make a comparison with the Catechism for instruction, then doctrine to take the Sangraha and the sentences, and for participation, the Nutrandadi with the secret of the rosary. Now this again is a certain kind of comparative learning, but the point was that in each case, I'm trying not to squeeze the Indian part into Western categories, but rather to say that when we look and learn from the Sanskrit and Tamil texts, it changes the way we read the Christian texts, and we have different categories that cannot be fit into Christian terms. So Apayadikshita, the very refined terminology of the Sangraha, you can't simply fit that into Christian theological terms. But if you learn it, you begin to understand many wonderful things. So the back and forth, I think you see the point of this. Um, at one point, I was uh, trying to understand what I was doing, and I made a pile of the text that I was working on. So I have the Tamil text and the French text and Sanskrit and Latin all piled up and saying, if you read these books, then you have a lifetime of knowledge. Um, trouble is most people don't believe me because they don't have the time to read such books. And they're not going to learn Sanskrit and read in Sanskrit or learn French and read in French. But I think you, I hope, this makes some sense to you. Study, study, study in the long term. And to conclude, these points, and then we'll have time for discussion. The categories of the modern West are inadequate to the subtleties of Indian thought. Traditional learning of India needs to be respected and studied, including by scholars in the West, also according to the standards and methods of traditional Indian learning, which we do here. The traditions of the Christian West also need to be respected and studied not simply talked about, but actually studied by people like you. If we study slowly and surely, as in the study of Mimamsa, we are making sure progress in learning. And this, I think, is speaking to those of us who are scholars, like all of us in the room. If you want to change the world quickly, don't do this. If you want to make a big difference and make the headlines, this is not the way to do it. The study of Mimamsa, study of Vedanta, study of Latin, study of Greek is a slow, sure process of taking tradition and bringing it into the 21st century. And that, I think, is something we can do. If we study beyond our own tradition, this can enhance and deepen even the most familiar Shastras are understood. So we learn Shastra according to Shastra, but we learn it in a 21st century way that I think might even surprise the great scholars of our traditions, because we do something different, because we are different people. So with that lovely thought, I'll stop there. Thank you very much.